Good evening, everyone. I'm Anthony Las Greek, Kilo 8 Zulu Tango. And tonight's topic is the 10 worst antennas. And what you don't see is the rest of the title and how you can do better. This is my contact information. And I also have a website, kzt.com. Now, if you've been to any of my presentations before, you know that I always have homework and I always have resources embedded in it. So you'll want to be able to get back to this presentation. We'll also post the PDF of this on the Rat Pack site along with the video. But anytime you see this font or this little symbol, that means there's something you can click on in the document to get more resources. So let's jump into the worst antennas. We'll start off with the three worst antennas. These are the no antenna at all. I can guarantee that that is the worst antenna you can have. There is no antenna worse than no antenna at all. Even hooking up a dummy load is a potential antenna that's much better than no antenna at all. The second one is you had good good intentions. You bought that antenna at a flea market or from that ham dealer, but it's still sitting in a package unassembled in your garage, your attic, uh, outside, in the rain, whatever, but it's not doing any good unassembled. The third one is that an antenna that you've assembled but not installed. And I, I'm guilty of having one of those currently. It's a rather complicated antenna with no instructions on how long each of the tubes should be. So I've got to go through and tune everything up from scratch. So that's waiting to be installed. But it's going to be a field day project. The fourth antenna is an antenna that you've improperly assembled or was much too complicated to possibly ever figure out how to assemble. And... Uh, that is the case with some antennas. They just don't get assembled right because they're too complicated. Um, and that's probably the case with this antenna I'm working on right now in my garage. The fifth one is an antenna that's improperly installed and or you use poor feed line. You know that closeout RG59 you bought at Radio Shack before they closed and you've had it sitting up in the 150 degree attic for the last 20 years. That's probably not the best way to get your antenna to work no matter what the antenna is, poor feed line or improperly installed antennas can be a problem. We'll talk about some other uh, issues with antenna installation as we go along here. There's some ways you can really deter you can really take away from the performance of your antenna by not installing it properly. The sixth one is an antenna that requires a counterpoise but doesn't have one. Now, there are antennas that say no radials required, but they still have a counterpoise. Some of them have uh, aluminum and rods for counterpoise. Some of them have two different halves, like a dipole actually has a counterpoise in a way. And if you have an end-fed antenna, sometimes the counterpoise might be the coax. So I'm not saying radials. I'm going to say counterpoise because every antenna needs some sort of uh, process to balance out the antenna. So there is a counterpoise quite often involved. Sometimes it's in the construction of the antenna and you don't need to do anything else. But other times you need to add something like radials. And if you don't do that, things are not going to work very well. Number seven, no antenna for a desired band. Now we're getting a little bit picky here. And you notice now we're getting into the need more category. Uh, this could be something as simple as uh, you want to work 160. And a lot of people say, I never work 160 because I don't have an antenna for that band. Now, sometimes you actually have an antenna for that band, but you just don't realize you do. Some antennas can be tuned up in different fashion with an antenna tuner, and they might work just fine on a band that they're not designed for. If it works, you can use it. It might not be the best antenna, but it's better than, again, no antenna at all. Number eight, the wrong takeoff angle for target geographic area. This is a problematic uh, in a more esoteric fashion because we are obviously making contacts, but now we're getting picky and saying we want to work specific areas. So we need to have an antenna that has a takeoff angle that would get us to that geographic area. If you don't care about where you're talking to, you can forget about number eight. It's not important at all. You can still make contacts with any takeoff angle. Now, when we talk about takeoff angle, that's the angle at which the radio radiation, the, the radiated energy from your antenna leaves if it would all go straight up it's going to go straight up and then be refracted straight back down and actually some people design antennas to do this they're called nvis antennas 
These are near, near vertical instance antennas where we want to cover close in areas. But most of the time we want to get a little bit further geographically, so we want a lower takeoff angle for longer distances. So again, it's not a right or wrong. Uh, it just depends on where you want to contact. So sometimes you want a high takeoff angle, other times you want a low takeoff angle. Now, I'm not suggesting this is a starting point, but if you go to some of the contesting stations, they may have four 20-meter beams stacked on one antenna, on one tower. And guess what? By switching which beams they use, they can change the takeoff angle. They can also choose whether they want to use the top and bottom, whether they want to use all four, whether they want to use the second one, the third one. So by doing switching that, they can actually hear what the best uh, potential is for contacting that particular location. So again, if you don't care who you're talking to, forget about takeoff angle. But if you do want to direct it in a certain thing, you need to pay a little bit of attention to your takeoff angle. Number nine, no back amp antenna in a portable field operation. And I have a pres I have a link here just to prove that these work. I'll click on that link, and you'll see that it brings you out to a presentation on portable operations. And I would normally scroll all the way through to this, but I'm just going to explain it because it's going to take me a while to get down to it. Two is one and one is none is a term used by a number of military branches and other service organizations. And it basically means if you only have one and it fails, that means you have none. So two means that you have one if one fails. Now, my wife and I typically travel fairly good distance for field day every year. We go to a different state each time. And uh, I make sure that I always bring in two antennas and two radios with me. Why do I bring two? Because if my radio fails or my antenna fails, I'm guaranteed no contacts. And I put some effort into going to these different locations, and I want to make sure that I can at least make some contacts. So by having that second backup antenna, that means that my chances of successfully making contacts increase. Now, the nice thing I do is I bring a backup antenna that has different characteristics. So if one of my two antennas is not functioning as well as the other one in the in the certain situation, the other one will work better. So I typically use an N-fed antenna and I use a vertical antenna. Uh, my vertical is a push-up uh, fiberglass mast with a element in the middle of it and it resonates very well. I actually also have, often have a third antenna at field day. And again, I'm operating uh, one or two stations, so it's nice to have at least two antennas, but it's nice to have the third antenna as a different antenna that works in different fashion. So again, if you're determined to make a contact in a field or portable operation, remember the two is one and one is none idea. Now, number 10 is good but gone bad. This is that antenna that you put up and you did it. It's a great antenna. It's worked well for a while, but now it's ready to fall down because either it's been so long since you paid any attention to it or you didn't do a real good job of installing it in the first place. Maybe you didn't weatherproof the connections and now it's filling up with water. Maybe you didn't use the best support structure and now it's, it's ready to fall down. So this is a problem. Now, what we can do sometimes is we can actually design the antenna so the weak point that fails won't cause the antenna to be a problem. So I use inverted in, inverted Vs and slopers quite often. In the portion that's down near the ground, I always make sure I put in a cheap bungee cord between the tie down and the antenna. Why do I do that when I know it will break within a year or two? Because I'd much rather have that bungee cord break than my wire antenna or my connector at the top of the tower, which is much more difficult to replace. I'd rather have the stress take place in that cheap bungee cord that I can reach out from the ground and change. So sometimes we want to build in uh, some weak points that will protect the rest of the antenna. So those are the 10 points. And now you say, Anthony, you did this in less than 10 minutes. You're now done with the talk. And we know you always go way over. Dan always knows that I go way over. So this is just the beginning because the 10 worst antennas are not the solution for tonight. We really want to talk about how you can do better. And I know some of you are also disappointed because I didn't name any specific antennas. We'll save that for later. And I'll talk about some antennas that maybe some people don't think are very good antennas. But those are my 10 worst and I'm sticking with it. So let's talk now about how to make it better.
Let me count the ways. The first one is get at least one antenna up and working. That takes care of our first three bad antennas. By having one antenna up and working, you can always upgrade it later. A simple dipole or an end-fed wire can be very inexpensive starting points. And once you get that antenna up, you can start making contacts. That gets rid of the first three bad antennas on the list by having at least one antenna up and working. The second thing is take time to properly assemble the antenna according to the directions. Now, if it's a wire antenna, it's a matter of measuring lengths and doing cutting and things of that nature. If it's an aluminum antenna, it may involve some structural uh, things, connectors, etc. But make sure you follow the instructions on what how it needs to be assembled. The second thing is you want to tune the antenna. Most antennas require tuning after they're assembled. Now, one of the things that new hams often forget, and sometimes old hams forget too, is when you tune the antenna, when you move it to a different location, raise it higher in the air, bring it in the field of other antennas or other metal objects, it might drastically be tuned differently and may be required to be retuned. So just be be aware that if you tune an antenna up in one location, then hoist it up in the air or move it to a different location, the tuning may be very different. So just remember that and act accordingly. Number three, keep it simple, Sam. Simple wire antennas are a great way to start out. They're very inexpensive and they work. Single band antennas are sometimes much better than multiple band antennas. They're less complicated. Some of them have more gain or more or work better than a multi-band antenna. That doesn't mean multi-antennas are bad, but I'm just saying if you want to keep something simple, sometimes a simple antenna on one band can be a great way to go. Avoid complex designs. The more complex the design, the more chances for you to assemble it wrong, and sometimes the more failure points available in it. Avoid, avoid severe compromises. When Dennis and I talked about our HF series about getting started, we got to the portion on, port on, part on antennas, and we start talking about how that was the sticking point for many people getting on HF. So what do people do when they get stuck? They try and figure out a way around it. And quite often, what they do is they choose a compromise. Now, some compromises work out just fine. Other compromises are so severe that they really hinder the operation. So what am I talking about compromises? Well, in antennas, it really comes down to two main compromises. Trying to make it smaller than it is and trying to figure out a way to get it up in the air without having to take the right steps. So smaller than it is, we do things like add loading coils. We miniaturize it. We want the mini version of it. We want to be able to carry it in our back pocket and have it work on 160. And the second thing we do is for erecting up, erecting the antenna. We don't necessarily have the right supports. We don't have the supports high enough. We don't have the supports that are going to keep the antenna up. So these are some of the compromises we get into. The other compromise sometimes is choosing an antenna that is designed to work on many bands poorly as opposed to one or two bands of well. And what do I mean by that? It's that antenna that they say will tune from four, from 440 megahertz all the way down to 160. And it works just fine. Well, there's got to be some compromises involved with an antenna like that because that's just not the way antennas work. So compromises are sometimes very problematic. So let's talk about simple. And you can't get much simpler... That is with about 16 foot across the top of it, just a little more than that. So very simple, doesn't take a lot of wire. Now the first thing you might see is when I when I made this diagram, I took these nice fancy little connectors on this diagram. 
they're ceramic and they're really high quality. But guess what? Go down to the Dollar Tree or and spend a dollar twenty-five because of inflation and buy one of those white cutting boards that they have in the cooking area. You can use those, cut a small strip of it with two holes on each end for the end insulators. In the middle, you might want to make it like a diamond shaped or a T shaped, and you can not only have a spot to connect both of your wires, but you also have a way to to bind your cable to it so it's mounted on the same piece of cutting board and that means you're going to have a good structural uh, thing so there won't be this wire pulling down on here and snapping off so again it can be something as simple as a one dollar 25 cent cutting board or you might just go in the kitchen right now and take one but i can't guarantee what will happen to you if you do that especially if you take that one that was very expensive so best bet go to the dollar store and buy a cheap uh, plastic um, a cutting board and cut it up. So here's the sizes. And you notice that when we start getting lower in frequency, we get down to 160 meters. We're now talking about a span of 160 feet approximately. So it starts to get a little difficult to fit that. I'm sorry, 260 feet. 260 feet would not fit in my property at all, but I do have 160 antenna, so we'll talk about that later. How did I get that in there if it wouldn't possibly fit? So the first thing we can do to save space is if we make it into an inverted V, we can do two things. We can go from two supports on either end to one support in the center, and it also means that our total length of the antenna will be reduced because of those two ends drop down and our total length from point A to point B will be less. Now, number four in our Make It Better is avoid black boxes, antennas with excessive superlatives, especially with the word miracle in them or super or maximum or anything along those lines. Over here on the right, we have an antenna. This is shown full size. This is the full size of this antenna. It's a little less than four inches in length here for the control box. The whip extends to about six feet, maybe five. But this particular one will tune all the way from 80 meters all the way up to the 440 band on, a, on a UHF. Now, because this is only six foot long, we know we're going to have to do something to match it to the coax. And the way we do that is we have to provide inductance and capacitance. So that's what these two little dowels do. There is some sort of in magic inductor in here and some magic capacitance in here. And by tuning these two little knobs, we can get this uh, to work on any of these bands. More about that in a minute. Before we go there, let's look at another solution. This is really simple, but here we're paying a premium for it. If we go to the Wet Noodle Antenna Company, we can buy this best straight wire available antenna. Notice the superlatives in here. The best straight wire. Perfect for stringing between trees. Accurate. Fast to install. Premium selectivity. Optimized for ham radio by our unique process. And right here is our superlative of how it operates. You're 599, old man. So notice this is simply a random length of wire that we're paying $149 for. So... Let's get back to this antenna a second. I have one very similar to this. Mine only has one knob on it, and mine doesn't claim it goes quite this wide in frequency. And guess what? I've used it before, and I've made plenty of contacts with it. Does it work great? No. Does it work well? No. Does it work? Yes. You can make contacts with those type of antennas, but you can also make contacts with tuned shopping, shopping carts, rain gutters, light bulbs, baseball backstops, Almost anything that's metal you can tune up and make contacts with. Matter of fact, this gentleman here, David Day, has a whole article on his light bulb antenna basics and FAQ. Not only does he use light bulbs to prove that they work, but he's also found the light bulbs that work the best. So if you want to just use light bulbs for all your antennas, and I know some of you are saying, well, my Elmer told me when I was a novice, just hook up a light bulb to it and I could tune up my radio. And how many of you may have gotten a contact that you didn't realize you were going to get when you thought you were using your light bulb as a dummy load? So almost anything will be able to make contacts. It just not, might not be the best thing to make contacts with. Now, in this little video from uh, VA3OSO and his 
partner in crime, they go out with an antenna tuner. Let me restart this here again. Back to your old self again. All right, so ever since I, I got this uh, MFJ tuner, it said its its thing was it can tune up anything. Do you remember reading that? I think I remember reading that. And I kept thinking, oh, it'll tune up anything. This was three years ago. No, two years ago. I was thinking, if it can tune up anything, I could tune up anything. So that's what I'm going to do today, try to do today. So we've got uh, the normal setup with some coax. And then... Uh, I've got some counterpoise and some salt water. Oh, that's for later. For making noodles. That's later. Mm -hmm. But yeah, right now we're gonna try to tune up this uh, baseball diamond backing. What are the so they tune up the backstop, then they go on to tune up other things. They make contacts with it, of course. Then they do some rain gutters, and finally. And uh, yeah, do you just want to? Uh, yeah, it's just to this. Right. They do the wet noodle, but they don't use any actual noodles. They actually just so, soak a rope uh, in salt water and use it as their the, wet uh, noodle. So I'll let you watch this at your leisure, but it's interesting. Because it said it could tune anything up, they wanted to make sure that it could. So they made plenty of contacts with it. Number five. Unfortunately, the antenna literature is filled with subjective and useless statements. I, I love advertisements where it says something like, I worked Slovenia with my first contact with this miracle antenna. He gave me a 5 and 9 with only 5 watts of power. It worked better than XYZ that I used last year. No substantiated information. No, nothing that we can really, truly see how the antenna works. So let's look at if the antenna if the length of the antenna is impractical for you, one of the choices is zigzagging. With your dipole, it doesn't have to necessarily be in a straight line. Almost every year when I end up putting up my end fed for field day, the trees aren't in a row. Someone forgot to plant the trees in a row for me, so I end up zigging and zagging to make sure I get enough trees to hold up my 130-foot end fed antenna. But guess what? The radio signals don't mind zigging and zagging, and your antenna will work just fine. So if you need to zig and zag a little bit around your backyard to fit your antenna in, that's one way to fit a long wire into a short property. I already mentioned the use of inverted Vs will reduce the total length of the antenna and also reduce the number of supports. The delta loop is one of many types of loop antennas using wire loops. There's a number of them. I have two links here with information on it. This is a simple delta loop right here. Uh, this particular delta loop has the point of the triangle pointing up, and it feeds it from this little point on the side here. So this particular antenna will be vertically polarized. Now, what's the advantage of vertic vertically polarizing your delta loop? That means you do not need to have it off the ground as high. If you had this turned over upside down, you would have to have this antenna up higher as a horizontal antenna for it to work well. But it, because it's a vertical antenna, you could have it as low as a couple feet off the ground. And this is a this particular one is showing 10 feet, but that's, that's not necessary even how high you have to have it. So again, this type of antenna is a lot shorter and takes up less space than if you had the wire stretched out. These two links are articles. This, By the way, this website has not only good information on loops, but it also has information on other types of antennas and antenna construction. But in this article, they show you that you can use any of these different types of shapes for loops. Here's the one we were using, but you could also use this type of diamond or uh, delta, uh, squares, hexangles, anything you want. They talk here about what the potential gain is. I'm sorry, the potential impedance is of the different types of antennas. Uh, and you can change that by where you choose to feed it at. So changing the feed point will change the polarization and also change the impedance. He talks about other shapes here and so forth. Talks about full full uh, wavelength loops, which Dennis has one of at his house. Uh, he has a huge area there to put one up, so you could do that. Talks about that. So there's a lot of information here, but the one I suggest you start out with if you want to play around these loops is go with a vertically polarized uh, loop uh, to play around with and i think that's the easiest one to get started and get it working and it's here's in the dimensions for them the second one is another link on uh loops 
This is by DJ Zero IP, and he has his 40 meter loop here, but he also you can scale this down to any size you want. So you see on 40 meters here, he has it uh, 6.6 .6 feet above the ground. So if we do this for 20 meters, three feet should be plenty to have it up in the air. And he has a total height of 33 feet. Again, with 20 meters, we can easily do it on a 20 foot fishing pole or push up uh, fiberglass mast. And he goes through the building it and different things about it on lengths, adjusting it. He has an 80 meter version. He has instructions on how to build it. So go ahead and take a look at both of those two links. I told you there'd be homework tonight. Number seven, if possible, get your antenna outside. Now let's talk a little bit about that. You might say, well, Anthony, of course I need to have my antenna outside. Well, the problem is for some of us, our neighbors in our neighborhood doesn't allow us to put antennas outside, so we have to resort to things like attics. And attics can work okay. One of the nice things is your attic, your antenna doesn't get wet and it doesn't get worn out as quickly from the sun because it's up in the attic. One of the problems is with a traditional all wood and slate roof, no problem at all. But what's happening now is a lot of the insulation that's being used between the roof and the shingles has aluminum and backing on it. So you may actually have a Faraday cage as opposed to a true attic uh, from many years ago. So before you spend a lot of time in the attic, check and see what you have to go through to get out of the attic. It might or might not work well. I can't guarantee either way. Sometimes what you can do is um, a little trick I've seen before. Use an attic antenna, but put it right at the roof line, right above the shingles where no one can see it and just put a feed into your attic that way. So you can run a dipole right on the right on the peak of your roof and no one knows it's there. They can't see it any, from anywhere. Unless they fly a drone over your house. Um, so outside is often better, but sometimes as we said with, a, with HOAs and other things, you might be forced to use an inside antenna. You might not even have an attic. You might have to put it in the window of your house. Again, try and get closer to windows, away from doors and I mean, away from metal objects, et cetera. And you can get inside antennas to work, but not great. Remember, though, with any of these inside antennas, you're going to be a lot closer to the antenna. So make sure when you do your calculations for RF exposure, you're taking into account that the antenna is a foot and a half above your head or whatever it is. So that's the other problem with sometimes with inside antennas. Uh, lower your power. That's one of the great ways to get that uh, number down quickly. Second thing is you want to try and get your antenna away from other antennas and metal objects. Now, that's somewhat impossible in some cases because there just isn't a lot of property to put your antennas on, so they might end up pretty close. But again, remember that will change the tuning of the antenna. You want to get the antenna at or near its recommended height as a minimum. Whenever you're talking about a horizontal dipole, uh, and type of antenna, you want it approximately a half length length or higher. No problem on six meters, 9.5 feet. I think I can do that. On 160, 260 feet. Now that's 260 foot with two supports that are both 260 feet high, and you got to be able to get the antenna up there some way. So it becomes very impractical to put up horizontal antennas at very low frequencies because of the height that they should be above ground. Now, what happens if we take this 80-meter antenna, and instead of putting it 131 feet, we put it at, oh, 30 feet, which is very doable in most cases. It drastically changes our radiation angle. So we'll have a very high radiation angle. It'd be great for close-in contacts, but probably not do a very good job on DX. So what happens with these lower frequencies, quite often we have to switch away from horizontal antennas and go with verticals, or inverted L's or other types of antennas where part of the antenna at least is running up and down so that we don't have to worry about this aspect. If the recommended height is impractical, uh, think poss possibly an inverted V because it doesn't make it any that much lower, but it means you only need one support that high. Verticals. With proper counterpoises and radials, you don't have to worry about the height above ground. But do remember that when you raise a vertical up above the ground, it changes the way it works also, and it changes your 
radials. So sometimes by raising a vertical up off the ground, we can get away with less counterpoises by using tune counterpoises. By the way, um, there's I, the question always comes up about verticals. When I'm putting down radials, how long should they be? What's the formula? We have all these formulas for different lengths. Unfortunately, the formula for a wire lying on the ground as a radial is very unpredictable because of the soil type you have and a number of other factors. So when you read most of the books, they say put as many as and as long as possible in, but they don't give you exact lengths. But if you raise it above ground, then you can tune that radial to a specific length and get by with a lot less radials. So sometimes there is advantages to raising even a vertical above the ground a little bit. Inverted L's are especially popular on the low bands of 80 and 160. And a delta loop, again, uh, was one way to get our antenna without being as high as we need to with a horizontal dipole. We've been talking mostly about, v about HF, but let's talk a little bit about VHF and UHF and other line of sight contacts. And sometimes we do line of sight contacts on HF also, especially 10 meters. If possible, you want to match the polarization of the other stations you want to talk to. Now, it's by we've set up a convention to coordinate this so everyone is doing the same thing. So I don't have to ask the other person, what's the polarization of your antenna? The convention typically is for FM, we use vertical polarization. For single sideband and digital, we use horizontal polarization. And this probably comes from the fact that most of FM was used in mobile vehicles and was quite often used. So I think it was much more convenient to go with vertical polarization, vertical polarization for these, but I'm not sure if that's exactly what the reason is, but that's the way most people do it. Now, the other thing is, if you can't match the polarization, are you not going to be able to make contacts? Yes, you will. You'll lose a significant amount of signal strength, but you can still make contacts. Again, it goes back to our first three rules of antennas. No antenna is the worst antenna. Any antenna is better than no antenna. So even having an opposite polarization on VHF and UHF, even though it will lose quite a bit of signal, is still better than no antenna at all. So this next weekend when I operate in the uh, AWRL uh, VHF UHF contest, I will be using my horizontally polarized six meter antenna, which is great. But unfortunately, I don't have a horizontally polarized two meter or 440 antenna. So I will be using those for my two meter single sideband and my two meter digital. Will I make contacts? Well, based on previous years, yes, I always do. I've even made contacts as far as Virginia on 440 with my five watts and my little vertical on my roof of my house. The trick was the other station was on a mountain. He was running 1,500 watts, and all the work was happening on his side. So even though I lost a lot of signal with my 5 watts and my wrong polarization, we were still able to make the contact. So don't think if you don't have the right polarization, you can't operate. Just think if you really want a reliable all-the-time connection, you might want to consider an antenna with the proper polarization but some of us never get around to that. Now, here's the good th good news. If the signal is being refracted off the atmosphere, which is the case for many of most of our HF contacts, this doesn't matter at all. So it doesn't matter which way the other stations polarize because when it comes back down to earth after it's been refracted, we don't know which direction it's gonna be polarized. So even if we try and match it, we can't be assured that our match is gonna work because we don't know what's gonna to happen to the signal. So don't sweat this on HF. Now, if you're making HF contacts uh, line of sight, yes, it does make a difference then. Another thing is this is a point where having two different antennas, one vertically polarized, one horizontally polarized for a given band, lets you switch between them on SkyWave communication and see which one is working better. So again, that two antennas is always better than one antenna. So here's a really simple little vertical ground plane for uh, VHF or UHF. This one's fancy. They have an end connector on the bottom of it. This one's fancy here in that they got uh, telescoping 
elements so they can adjust this for different frequencies. But it's simply a little SO239 chassis mount with some screws to hold the radials and the center element is soldered on. Here's some commercial omnidirectional VHF UHF antennas. Now, consider adding an antenna with gain. Gain means favoring some directions at the expense of other directions. There is no free lunch in gain. You're gonna to have to give up some signal somewhere to get gain in another direction. But the good news is we can give up directions we don't want the energy to go in. So on our vertical like this, we don't want any energy to go straight up because what's going to happen with that? Well, first of all, it's not going to make any contacts. And second of all, it's not going to be refracted back to Earth by the atmosphere because it's too high of frequency. So we basically lose that. So we do want to have directional gain in a horizontal pattern on this antenna. We don't care about the waste, the waste of signal going up. It doesn't have to be a beam to have gain. Now, here's where one of our compromise issue comes up. The more length on a given antenna design, the more gain you're going to have typically. So we have three, we have four fiberglass VHF, UHF. They might be multiband antennas. I'm not sure exactly which they are. But the longer one is going to probably have much more gain. Might be twice as much. Might be three times as much as the shorter one. And it means that more of the signal is directed horizontally and not wasted going off the tip of the antenna. Also important in the case of these VHF, UHF antennas, notice they're all installed up high and in the clear. Now, wouldn't it be nice to have gain plus a little bit of directivity? Well, we can do that with beam type of antennas or array antennas. Beam antennas can increase the gain and provide directivity on any band if practical it becomes difficult as the wavelength increases. So on two meters, we're talking about three to three point two feet across. On forty meters, we're starting to get sixty six and a half feet across. Guess what would it, this would be at eighty meters? About one hundred and forty feet across, and it becomes very difficult. And on one sixty, it even be longer. So what do we do if we want to set up a beam type of antenna on these higher bands? We can set up an array of vertical antennas that are lined up either in a four square pattern or lined up in a row. And we can use different types of switching to have them still have gain based on multiple elements. So beam antennas put all of our elements, our driving el driven element, our reflectors, and our directors on one rotatable beam. But we can also make arrays where we're using wire antennas or vertical antennas to also get gain by having multiple elements. So multiple elements are not limited to aluminum that you can put up on a mast. The great news about this is we get gain both for receive and for transmit. That's one of the nice things about antennas versus amplifiers. Now, beam antennas can be very expensive, but they don't have to be, especially on the upper v on the VHF and UHF bands and on the upper HF bands because they're quite small. Here's a dual band, two meter and 440 homebrew beam and he's used a wooden mast and pieces of, of aluminum and clothesline, which I built my first beam out of when I was a new ham back in 1981. And uh, these are nice because they come in a roll. You straighten them out. You drill a hole, push them through there. You drop this on the ground. It gets bent immediately, but you can straighten it back out again. It doesn't matter. There's a great book by uh, Bob, Bill Orr on building these types of antennas. I started off by having a two by two wooden mast. I made the Long John two meter beam uh, that had a, a a aluminum rod and then the rest of it were these clothesline wire and it had a T-match on it. I put a short piece of uh, connector on the top of, of uh, string on the top of it, mounted a fishing swivel to the ceiling of the one bedroom on the second floor in our apartment put two drinking straws, one on each end of it, facing up towards the ceiling so that the ends would stay uh, even and it also wouldn't spin around on its own. And I could use that. I made contacts of over 200 miles on two meters uh, from my bedroom uh, ceiling-mounted antenna. 
That was before we had children. When my son was born, he moved into the room with the antenna and I kept it up there and I would go in and operate it. He thought it was a mobile, I'm guessing, as an infant, but it was really an antenna with a lot of gain that was very inexpensive. Another type of antenna that you can build fairly easily is a moxin. A moxin is a uh, type of gain antenna beam that uses uh, wires that are folded on the ends. Here's a piece of software a link to it. You can download this software. You don't even have to install it. We'll just download it and run it here. You gotta unzip it though. And you can put it in the frequency. Let's say we want 10 meters. Let's let's choose uh, we'll put it exactly for the we'll do 10 meter FT8, 28.74. Calculate and you see that it's about 12 foot for line A and line E is about six foot. So very easily to build, you could build this very easily and have that up on a mass pipe and rotate it by hand or with a simple TV rotator. Now, we get to the real homework of tonight. This link, tie.cc port antenna, which I'm gonna click on right now, brings you out to a document that it started out as one page, but as what usually happens with my documents, it grew and grew and grew. This was originally designed for three years ago for field day because our club was not gonna be able to do field day as a group because of the pandemic. And everyone all of a sudden had to figure out how to operate field day from home. So I put together this uh, originally designed for portable antennas, but it grew after that comparing the pros and cons of different types of antennas. These are all wire antennas, dipole resonant, dipole non-resonant, offset fit, fit, center, feed, inverted Vs, end feds, wire loops such as delta loops, pros and cons, and some notes. Then verticals, beams, magnetic loops, integrated antennas. These are the ones that go on the radio itself, similar to rubber ducks and other things like that. Mobile antennas. Then for each of these different categories, I have a number of resources, either sites on how to build the antenna, articles on the antenna, YouTubes on the antenna, or in some cases, actual commercial links to commercial versions if you don't want to build it yourself. So I have halfway resonant, non-resonant, resonant, non-resonant, non and fed, inverted Vs and slopers, wire loop antennas, vertical antennas, beam antennas, stealth and indoor antennas, 10 meter antennas, 160 limited space antennas, magnetic and compact transmit antennas, or loop antennas, integrated antennas, mobile, VHF, UHF, satellite antennas, and then a bunch of general antenna resources, including the AWRL uh, wire antenna resources page, the AWRL antenna book. And I love these books by Bill Orr, the Beam Antenna Handbook. And it bills a silent key now, but you can still find this book used. Go to the next flea market, look for a bill or handbook, antenna handbook, and there'll be a lot of great information on do-it-yourself antennas. Now, there's a guide from the villages in Florida. They have a lot of HOA uh, dwellings there, so they put together this chart, and they actually have a whole document that goes along with this. But what they basically did is they went through and graded each of these different antenna types based on their on-air performance, their stealthiness, whether they required a tuner or not. And then they graded the installation, the cost, and then performance on individual bands. So you can see, for example, that the uh, flagpole antenna was good on the air, very stealth. Installation was com somewhat complex and cost was very high. And it worked well on some bands, but not as well on other bands. So you can see information for this in the the link here also has the full presentation where they go into each of these different types of antennas and discuss them in detail. So you can go through this 72-page uh, document and go to any of the different sections and find out about off-center spiral dipole or the uh, flagpole L. There's a lot of great ideas in here on HOV hidden antennas, but also a lot of good use on antennas. And I stopped randomly on something I was going to discuss anyway, so let's just talk about this now. Many of you thought that tonight I would have one of my top 10 worst antennas would be the G5RV. It's a misunderstood antenna, and unfortunately, for the most part, what we actually call the G5RV is not really the G5RV the same way 
Louis Varney designed it originally. We have mini versions. We have all sorts of different feed conversions of it. So they do work just fine if you use them in the parameters that they're designed for. But if you think this is an all-band, work-everything antenna, it's not going to be that. Depending on the length, in this case of the Junior, it basically is a 40-meter antenna. Uh, the full G5RV can be an 80 through 10 antenna. But again, the ones that we call G5RVs are not really necessarily G5RVs. And they're no better or worse than other antennas. The problem is we try and say that we want to do everything with them and people hype them to the point that when people actually use them, they say, well, that didn't work as well as it should have. So there's a variety of information in here and you can go through this whole presentation and then the presentation inside of that presentation from the villages group. Now, portable operations, uh, I have a link here to a whole presentation I did for Rat Pack uh, about a year ago, I think it was, on portable operations. And in here I talk about uh, portable antennas and use of antennas in different types of portable activities. Now, sometimes it's not the antenna at all. Sometimes it's other things like operator technique. So I have three presentations here. The first one talks all about operating technique. The second one is to assess your station. And this is a great resource for antennas because in here I talk about how to use the reverse beacon network to check out different antennas and compare them. The reverse beacon network uh, will listen for a CW uh, CQ or CW test with your call sign, and then it will give you a signal to noise ratio report from around the world from different stations that hear you. And they're there listening all the time. So you can sit there with five different antennas and compare them, see how the results compare. You can try to see how, how near the bandwidth is on your beam by moving in small amounts and then retry trying the test and seeing what the re reverse beacon network values look like. So again, in this presentation, about halfway through, I talk about the reverse beacon network. So what I did is a simple A-B test. I had my Yagi with five watts pointed at 270 degrees. I transmitted test K8ZT. It found my information. It gave me a signal to noise ratio from each of the stations. I then did the same thing with my 43 foot vertical, same power. And then I compared the stations that I heard on both antennas. In some cases, the beam was better. In some cases, it was not. In some cases, it may have been because the beam was pointed at a different angle than I needed for that particular station and the vertical covered it. But again, it's a great way to compare different antennas using the reverse beacon network. And that information and doing that is here. There's also information on using online software defined radios to listen to your own signal and get record it and actually get an accurate sound of what you sound like each of these locations. Now, we're talking about antennas a lot tonight, but some of us are beginners at HF. So uh, Dennis W6DQ and I put together a series of three presentations on HF antennas in the second, I mean, I'm sorry, on HF operating, and the second one focused on equipment and antennas. By the way, Dennis and I are coming back for reprieve. Week number four is coming up on June 21st, I think is, if I remember correctly. He's he's looking right now on his calendar to see if I'm lying about the date. I can't remember off the top of my head. We also have a similar thing that I did with Marty Wold N6VI on VHF and UHF. And again, in here we talk a lot about antennas. So there's a lot of good information on VHF, UHF antennas in these four weeks of presentations. So that's the end of my presentation for tonight, but I'd be happy to take questions. And I will also put up here a diagram of what antennas I have at my home. So the link is tiny.cc slash worst dash antenna. And I'm going to see if I can find the other slideshow that I forgot to open up here. While I'm doing that, we'll go ahead and take questions and answers. And I'm going to try and find this. Put your hand up. Go ahead. Hand. Yeah, this is uh, Gene N3XUS here in uh, Texas. Uh, I'm a technician class, and a lot of times... I can only, well, not all the time, all the time, but uh, definitely I can only do 10 meters. And mm -hmm. I use verticals. 
and I've used yes. calculators and charts and instructions yep. for the antennas as far as measuring the counterpoise. If I have a counterpoise at X length, but the full wire goes out to YZ, which is much longer, how does that affect the, you know, the effect of the counterpoise? I mean, is well, longer better? Again, what I said before, it depends on what type of counterpoise. If it's lying on the ground, there really is not a formula that I know of that's accurate for all different types of soil. So it's very different depending on where it's at. So sometimes measuring those is not the way to go. And then the other thing too is, let me just talk a little bit about verticals in 10 meters for a second. Let me just diverge for a second. This is my home and I have a 43 foot vertical here. It's a, it has an a antenna tuner at the base. And I also have a small beam here on a 50 foot tower and I have two sloper antennas. What I find as my personal experience is with these type of beams, I'm sorry, with these type of verticals, they work fairly well on 40, 30, 20. But as you start getting up 15, 12, and 10, the performance really drops off. Again, if it's possible, and because it's a small size, if there's any way to put up a small 10-meter beam, and one of the things you can do, and I talk about it in my 10-meter presentation, is you can even buy a used CB antenna and convert it into 10 meters very simply because, because the antenna will be a little bit long for for the CB band, so you can trim it down and make it work on 10. So if you can put up a small beam, you would get a great improvement in 10 meters. Even putting up a rotatable dipole up on a support will do better on a vertic than a vertical antenna in most cases for 10 meters. So I, I don't know about the radials and I'm not gonna be able to answer that question, but from my understanding, there really is no formula for the radials, it's pretty much the more radials you add, the better. But I think you're going to be chasing your tail a lot on 10 meters when there's a lot of better ways to go with 10 meters. Even a dipole right. would work better than the vertical. All right. Thank you very much. That was you're helpful. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Other questions? Let me check the chat here real quick. Oh, right here, someone says in 10 meters, they use an old 5.8 CB antenna. Yes, you can definitely for 10 meters. And I have a whole presentation on 10 meters. And let me just, um, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, any recommendations for two meter, 70 centimeter Yaggies or log periodics? Um, the log periodics have more bandwidth. The Yaggies tend to have more gain for the particular uh, antenna structure. The log periodics tend to be a little more expensive than the than the Yaggies. Um, but again, it depends on what you want. The Yaggies are also, uh, the log periodics are also much better for uh, multiple bands. Uh, so you can get a Yag you can get a log periodic that, that basically works from six meters all the way up to 1.2 gigahertz and everything in between because of the way they're designed. But you're going to be spending more money than you are with the 70 centimeter Yagi. So if you just want to work 70 centimeters in tubes in two uh, meters, probably a combination two meter 440 Yagi is probably a cheaper way and more gain for the buck. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I think all the way to the top. Wow. A friend made dipole using toothbrush handles for insulators. Any plastic will work. Um, someone made a contact with their Heath kit dummy load. Avoid, use, avoid using LEDs for dummy loads. Yes, definitely. Uh, does the ter the compromise type include terminated folded dipoles? It definitely does. What we do in that case, the compromise is to get an antenna to tune on multiple bands we add a resistance on the end and the resistance will always tune just like a dummy load will. Uh, so that's a way to get the feed to balance so that it, it is a compromise. They still work. Uh, and I know a number of people that use them, but they are compromised in some senses. Uh, yes, the miracle antenna works better on the days when we have good propagation, such as every antenna. Here's the saltwater antenna, which we had in our April full show. Does an automatic remote antenna coupler come into this? Um, 
I don't sure what they were asking about, but let me talk about that for a second. On my 43 foot vertical, I have at the base of it a MFJ antenna tuner that I feed the power with on the coax. So I use a what's called a T bias, a bias T that inserts the voltage in it, and the voltage to run the tuner it comes out through the coax. So I don't have to run a separate wire. When you're doing a vertical like that, if you can put the tuner at the base of it, much better performance. Uh, than running the coax into the shack and then putting the tuner on it. So I, I like my 43-foot vertical. It doesn't work very well on 160, and it doesn't work great on on 80, but it works great on 40, 30, and 20. My sloper on 80 meters works much better, and my sloper on 160 works much better than the vertical do does. But these type of slopers require a counterpoise on top, and that's what my basically my beam acts like on top of my tower here. And this is an a uh, an Alpha Delta uh, sloper that unfortunately just fell down right before the last 160 meter contest of the year. My wire finally broke up at the top here, so I got to go back up and fix that. But this comes down to about eight foot off the ground on this side, and this is only 60 foot long. My lot is only 75 feet by 166 feet, and my backyard is pretty small, so I had to wedge things in here. I was lucky enough to get a tower in there, but uh, not a lot of space to spare. My my um, beam is not a Yagi. It is actually a log Yagi. This is a uh, Sumner XP705. It, they use the combination of techniques of both Yagi building and and uh, log periodic building. So this covers uh, 40 and 30 meters as a rotatable dipole. And then it has 23 elements, uh, 15 three elements, 12 four elements, uh, 17 three elements, 10 four elements, and six four elements. So there's different numbers of elements on different bands, but it works pretty well. It doesn't work fabulously on six. It works okay. And of course, on, as a rotatable dipole, my vertical is often much better on 40 and 30. But again, sometimes I switch and sometimes it is a little bit better, but that's typically not the case. My Even my sloper here has a coil in it for 40, so it even works better than the, ver than the vertical or the... Uh, rotatable dipole quite often. Now this is just a little bit different view. This tree is no longer here. This tree has now departed us, but you can see my antenna up in there here. And by the way, uh, just while I'm still showing these maps, this is the same way I figure out what I'm gonna do for a field day. Because I'm going to a location I've never been before, I try and zoom in with Google Maps, and then you could right click on it and say measure, and you can put in these measurements to see how far it is between tree A and tree B on Google Maps. So. It just happens to be the way I did my house, but that's the same way I do when I'm trying to figure out portable location. By the way, I'll leave this up for a little while. This has all my presentations on it at tiny.cc slash k8zt-p. Let's see. Uh, I love my quad. The vertical loops don't interact with the ground as much as quads are great as far as operations. Uh, they have they work they work very well. They require a little bit more work as far as structurally mounting them and erecting them than beams do. That's why Yagis tend to win out. But I know people that have had fantastic results with beam with uh, quad antennas. Uh, vertical whip of the 40, 49 to one bound, that's the typical what an NFED is like. The Ed Fong tribanders are VHF UHF antennas. <laughs> yes, there is a there is a uh, a code for wire um, diameter. But when I'm operating portable I always run very thin wire. What is aluminum? What is the minimum effective length of a vertical antenna on a 160 meter band? I do use a remote automatic tuner. I, I don't know that there is a minimum effective length. I've seen them very short. Again, it depends on how much loading you put on the antenna. Now, one thing about verticals, especially on 160, 
most of the time we end up loading them from the base. It's much more effective if we can load, load them near the top. But the problem is on these antennas, when you put a very big load on top, they become very structurally problematic. So that's why a lot of people use top hats and other types of, of loading mechanisms for the top of the antenna. And sometimes you can use, make a top hat very effectively out of your guying system if the top parts of it are the elements that you use for the guy ropes. And I know that there's a couple commercial antennas that are sold like that for 160 where they have very extensive uh, guy ropes from the very top of them that act as a top hat for adjusting the resonance. <clears throat> Tom, I see you got your hand up. We'll get to you in a second. Yeah. Okay, let me just see if I got anything else here. Uh, okay. Okay, we'll go ahead, Tom. Yeah, as, as to your wire gauge, there have been very few cases to come out of it, but the ones that have come out of it have been devastating to the person who fell victim to it. If you're under 14 gauge, you're illegal in three quarters of the land mass of the United States, because that's how much of the United States is covered by the adoption of the National Electric Code. So if you go under 14 American wire gauge, and something happens that injures somebody, it's all you. There's nobody else to go after, it's you. And if you have any kind of insurance, they're gonna come after you hammer and tong because you broke the law. It's not a wise thing to do, especially not in a permanent location. For what that's worth, your mileage will of course vary. Okay. And he's when he's talking about under, he's talking about that you have that you have to be a number 14 or lower. So 14, 12, and 10. Remember the wire gauges get smaller as the number goes up. Next question, comment. You know evil, see no evil. <laughs> I'm surprised there's not, I, when I did this at Dayton last week, I had a ton of questions at the end. Okay, I may have missed something. I'm sorry. This is Gene yes, again. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what a lot of radios are coming out or have been out for a while that have uh, built in antenna tuners. Good, bad, great... ugly, what? Yes, let me, let me explain it. That. That's a great point, Gene. First thing is when you look at an antenna tuner internally, there are different varieties. Most of the ones are typically designed to match a three to one difference, okay? But if you have an Elecraft or a Zygu, most of those are designed to match a 10 to one difference. So there really is no, uh, the, the comparison really depends on the type of specs that the antenna tuner is designed for. So being internal doesn't mean it's necessarily not as effective an antenna tuner, but being a three to one is not nearly effective as a 10 to one antenna tuner. So what happens if you have a three to one antenna tuner, you're probably gonna end up needing another external antenna tuner unless you're using resonant antennas all the time. A that, lot of people describe some of the- That's outstanding information. Yeah, some, that's outstanding, thank you. Yeah, some of the people, these the, when they talk about the antenna tuners, they'll talk about the fact that those three to ones are basically to touch up they're not so much to do extensive tuning, but uh, I have a, in one of my presentations, and again, when you go to this link here, let me bring up the share again. When you bring up this link, it'll bring up all my presentations. And one of the presentations in there is on buying amateur radio equipment. And uh, in there, there's also a spreadsheet that goes along that talks about the various, let me find it here. So these are HF radios that are either currently available or have been recently discontinued. And if you look, one of the columns I have here is on internal antenna tuner ratio. So notice the ICOM 7300 has approximately a three to one, but notice the Kenwood TS590SG has a 10 to one ratio antenna tuner. But that doesn't mean just because it's Kenwood because the TS 480 SAT, the one with the antenna tuner, has a three to one in it. Three to one in the 991, three to one in the FTDX10, 
Yesu pretty much sticks with three to ones in most of theirs. Most of the other crafts are all 10 to one, including like the KX2 and the KX3 portable amps. I can tune anything with my KX3 for the most part. The Zygu surprisingly have 10 to ones in most of theirs that have antenna tuners. Now, a lot of their units do not have antenna tuners built in, but you'll notice that there is a difference. So when you're looking at these radios, look at the specs and see if they give you an antenna tuner description. If they don't give you some sort of ratio or some sort of information, you can assume that it's probably a three to one because they're not advertising the fact that they have a three to one. And then the question also comes up quite often, and I'm surprised it didn't come up yet, is is there an advantage or disadvantage to automatic antenna tuners versus manual antenna tuners? And for the most part, you're not going to find that much difference in the ability for them to work if you have, again, one with a high ratio. And again, it depends on the model that you're buying as far as how they work. So there's different types of antenna tuners out there, and not all antenna tuners are built equally. Other questions? Anything else in chat, Dan? You don't see anything. See anything. Okay. Go ahead, somebody. Hit. Okay, let's open it up for comments. Anybody got any comments out there? It was very informative. Uh, I'm walking away tonight with a lot of information that's going to be extremely helpful to me. And my uh, sit-ups, whether they be fixed or portable, I really do appreciate it. A lot of good information. I thank you very much from Texas. Well, you're very welcome. Hope to work you on there. Okay, Tom, you got your hand up. Yeah, I'm trying to unload uh, an overstocked Aries equipment cache. So I put a comment in the chat. If you're somewhere in the mid-Atlantic, I'm right on top of Washington, D.C. I got three Roni... Uh, two Roan H30s that just yours for the asking. All you have to do is get them out of here. And uh, 120 feet worth of uh, Roan 25 with all the equipment to put it up into 340 foot towers. Uh, you know, if you act before field day, you could have those puppies on hand. I just very much need to have them out of here since they turn out not to be as useful as I hoped for. Uh, emergency operations. They're just too bulky and take too long to put up. Um, but somebody out there needs them for home or or whatever, club or whatever. So contact me and I guess I should put my email in the chat. Okay, go right ahead and do that. Um, Steve writes, uh, remote couplers or antenna tuners have an advantage with certain types of antennas that allow a short mismatch between the antenna radio without moving the high voltage impedance. Yeah, and, and uh, Stan, that's Steve. That's correct. I just I, I didn't really go into that deep of it tonight, but yes, there's there's a lot more to antennas than what I talked about tonight. This was a very superficial uh, view of just getting started, and we didn't really even scratch the surface of the technical aspects of antennas by any means. And I never will know that because again, that's not my forte. I'm not really a technical person. I'm much more of a get on the air and operate person. So. I hope I provided some good information. Tom provided his email in there for the, everyone that's looking for towers. Please contact Tom. Grab that email be address before we're done tonight. Any other qu questions or comments? Dennis, tell us a little bit about your loop. Oh, your it's just loop. A, the it's a it's a 160 meter full weight loop, and it's low. It's only 100. And or I'm sorry, it's only 50 feet off the ground, but we don't have any ground here. We live in the desert. It's all sand. So your comment about uh, determining the length of radials so is, is so dependent on, on uh, soil conductivity and all that. There just isn't any here. <laughs> so it might as well be uh, 100 feet in the air. Uh, it works extremely well, and it, I cover uh, 160 meters through 10 meters without any trouble at all, uh, running legal limit. I use a uh, I use a remote tuner on it, but it's fed with ladder line. So and it's got a let's see ladder line and a nine to one balance so that I can uh, run it on the other bands, not just 160. So I use it effectively on on all bands. I think the only band I have problems with it on is 20 meters. Um, but I've got a 20 meter Yagi up in the air, so I don't worry about it. <laughs> I see if that. Dennis lived if Dennis lived in a saltwater swamp. 
his effective height would be so much lower that it wouldn't be as effective as it is right now. So I'd again, use, it, location, 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 location. You bet. I'd be using a lot more verticals. We do have a, a four square transmitting array here for uh, 75 and 80 meters using high towers. And that's quite an antenna. <laughs> But we've also got the real, you know, you mentioned earlier, we got the real estate here to be able to do that. So that helps a lot. We talk about real estate. What, how much is these antennas, real estate is these antennas taking up? Oh, probably about half the lot. <laughs> we got a five acre lot and probably taking up about half of it with antennas. And I got more going up. <laughs> so you let can't me just stop. pull out to another slide here to show you what, my 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 other antenna setup is like this slide this slide at the beginning of this presentation shows K3LR's antenna arrays he has a a tower here with four stacked 20 meter beams he has stacked 40 meter beams. This off to the off to the side here is a 160 array made up of six towers or five towers, I'm sorry, uh, that he uses. He uses aluminum towers with everything welded together so it's all one piece. So if you go to some of these contest stations, you're gonna see just the extreme of antennas beyond anything that I could possibly put in my backyard. But this station consists is located at almost at the Ohio line of Pennsylvania. It's about as far west in Pennsylvania as you can get. But they consistently come in first in their category in the world because of the, even though they're not on the East Coast, they have just a fabulous antenna arrays there. I had the opportunity here many years ago to be at a contest station like that. And uh, the owner of the station was working on one of his 80 foot antenna towers. Uh, and he asked me to, I was down with the station. He asked me to uh, give an RF check on it. So I, I just put out their testing one, two, three, I was on 20 meters and it was uh, stacks of 20 meter monobands. And some guy in Europe came back to me and says, holy cow, you're pegging my meter. <laughs> I was running barefoot. And and I, I will remind you all that I'm running only five watts into my antennas here, so I'm not stressing anything. But uh yeah, there's there's always there's always more room for improvement, but there's never a worse antenna than no antenna at all. So that's where I'm gonna leave leave my talk where we started at the very beginning. The worst antennas are those three. No antenna at all, antenna sitting in the garage unassembled, or the antenna that's not been installed yet. Those are by far the three. Anything else is going to outdo them hands down. So thank you, everyone, tonight. And with that, I'm going to close it down. Last call for questions. Comments or anything? And I got past an hour. <laughs> you did fine. 73s, everybody. See you tomorrow night.